this is the shift that is unfolding in front of our eyes. And so as people conceptualize their portfolio and think, okay, where's my anti-fragile assets? You know, what in this new environment uh, can I count on to withhold value in my portfolio? I think there's only a few answers that, that, that will that meet that. Uh, the first one is, is gold and more and more people are turning to that. The second is emerging market bonds. And the third is energy stocks. These are the things that will withstand their value in this new world we're entering. In light of this economic downturn that we may be experiencing today, what are the major risks and opportunities that investors face? Hint, the opportunities may not all be in the U.S. We're here to examine this theme with our next guest, fund manager Louis Gaff. He is a founding partner and CEO of GAFCAL and the uh, non-executive director at Evergreen GAFCAL, a fund with more than $4 billion of assets under management. Louis, absolute pleasure to host you today. Welcome to the Dave Lynn Report. Thank you very much for having me. It's a uh, delighted to be here. Uh, Louis, you are uh, very, very smart. I read some of your work and, um, I come from a macro research background myself, so I appreciate just how brilliant your insights are. We're going to be talking about the major risks that investors face today, the opportunities as well. But I'm, I'm going to start off by asking you a question that um, uh, my former colleagues at the macro shop that I worked at uh, love asking new uh, recruits. Um, it, it sets them up for their thesis quite well, which is S&P 500 up or down by the end of the year. What do you think? I think it's down. Down? Yeah. Okay. By, yeah, by, think- uh, by how much? Not by a lot, uh, but I think there's enough there's enough headwinds that uh, that'll struggle to 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 go up. I think if you look at the past, uh, you know, it's held up in the past few months in the face of bad news like Silicon Valley Bank and banking signature bank and such and banking crisis. It's held up thanks to a massive rally in just a handful of names: your your Apple, your Microsoft, your your usual suspects. And that to me doesn't seem like a very healthy rise. Um, and look, I think the the investment environment that uh, that we had last year of you know broadly higher energy prices, market that has to adjust to higher inflation, which means long term higher long term interest rates. I don't think that has changed fundamentally. So look, I, I don't think the market completely pukes out, but it's the the risk reward just doesn't seem that great on U.S. equities. Um, the, the reality is other equity markets around the world look much more attractive, mostly because you start off from a very different valuation starting point. Um, you know, the valuation gap between U.S. equity markets and most other equity markets around the world uh, is about as, as big as it's been. Um, and the reality is we now, you know, we've been for the past roughly 18 months or so in a phase where other markets are starting to outperform the U.S., um, for me, this is the new trend. So I know everyone talks about S&P 500 all day because it's the biggest, because it drives everything, et cetera. But it's, for me, it's not where the excitement is going to be in the coming years. All right. We are going to talk about uh, emerging markets and your view on non-U.S. equities and investments. But let, let me drill on domestic markets a bit further. The S&P is up about 8% year to date. Um, the NASDAQ actually had its best quarter since 2020. So a huge bull market so far. Uh, before we talk about uh, what you think is going to drive the performance of the future, let's recap what happened this past quarter. Why do you think, despite all these headwinds that you mentioned, that the stock markets have still performed well um, relative to its performance last year? I've heard several theories, one of which is that consumers and investors alike are a little bit more at ease with Fed monetary policy, seeing that the end of the Fed hike cycle is near, and so that may have boosted markets. What's your view? Well, I think that's definitely part of it. Um Look, in the past three weeks, the Fed has re-injected $400 billion into markets. Uh, you know, for all the talk about Fed tightening, in the past three weeks, the Fed has basically taken out nine months of quantitative tightening. Um, I think what we saw uh, with Silicon Valley Bank is the realization by most market participants that the Fed actually doesn't have two mandates, but three mandates. You know, everybody knows about that mandate and everybody knows about the employment mandate. There's a third mandate and that third mandate is financial stability. Um, and what we saw with Silicon Valley Bank is that when financial stability is threatened, the Fed will come back in and add liquidity back into the system. Um, and so I think this provided a deep sigh of relief from 
uh, from equity markets in the U.S. and elsewhere. But it also means that uh, the U.S. dollar is now a structurally weak currency. Um, I think what's uh, what's interesting amidst this Nasdaq rally or S&P rally that we've seen this year is that it's occurred against a backdrop of a weakening U.S. dollar, um, which sort of goes against uh, what we've seen in recent years. Right? In recent years, the U.S. dollar was strong and equities were strong, and the general market perception was. U.S. is the cleanest, dirty shirt. You have to be invested in the U.S. economy. Everywhere else is terrible. Um, now, all of a sudden, we're in an environment where actually, yes, equities go up, but at the same time, the dollar goes down. Because uh, people realize, well, when push comes to shove, the Fed actually isn't going to be tight. When push comes to shove, when financial market stability is threatened, the Fed will print money. Uh, and in such an environment, you know, why sit around in cash? Um, Having said this, you know, I think a big question, if I'm going to be wrong this year, you know, I think U.S. equities aren't that exciting, but we have to acknowledge that money market funds have just increased by $400 billion. You know, you've just had an increase of $400 billion in money market funds. And what we should all ask ourselves is, where does this money go over the next year? Does it stay in money market funds? In which case, okay, it doesn't have that much of an impact on markets. But if for whatever reason it decides to leave money market funds, that's a lot, a lot of firepower that can push a lot of asset prices higher. Um, so look, bottom line is quantitative, tighten quantitative tightening is over. Um, and, and that I think has triggered a big sigh of relief in equity markets. QT is over. Uh, are you saying that QE is back in, for, for the foreseeable future? I mean, this uptick that you're talking about in the Fed asset balance sheet, I'll show it sharp for the audience, it's true. Uh, but you know, people are wondering if that's, that's just a short-term thing, and they're done injecting liquidity. Yeah, I think they're definitely done injecting, like uh, re reducing. Well, they're done reducing their balance sheet. I mean, that's a fact. Um, they're done reducing their balance sheet. Uh, they're done withdrawing liquidity from the system. Uh, whether you want to call this quantitative uh, easing or not, we're having big debates uh, internally. You know, a lot of my guys say, "No, no, we can't call it quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is going out and buying long-dated bonds." Here, all they're doing is providing liquidity to the banks so that, uh, that the banks have uh, can provide liquidity at the end of the day to their own customers leaving, and the banks don't have to fire sell their own assets. So maybe it's not quantitative easing per se, but it is definitely balance sheet expansion. But I, I would say you know that's that's a distinction without a difference. Um, however, you you know you want to call it, the end result is still the same. There's now four hundred billion dollars additional in the global uh, you know, financial balance sheet that wasn't there three weeks ago. Um, so yeah, it probably isn't quantitative easing, uh, but quantitative tightening is done. People are talking about a pivot this year. This is not the consensus view that I've heard, but it is certainly a viewpoint that some people share. Where do you stand on this? Pivot this year, next year, no pivot at all? You said it. I mean, look, they were shrinking their balance sheet. Now they're expanding their balance sheet. To me, that's a pivot. Um, that's that's oh, a difference. Let me, let me rephrase: uh, a reduction of the Fed funds rate. Um, yeah. So this is this is very important, actually. Um, is what matters more to markets? Is it the cost of money or is it the availability of money? And the, because those two can be, you know, obviously there are two gauges that, that that you can move down. When I started in this business, my my very first client, a gentleman who unfortunately has since passed away, called Biet Knotts, told me, Louis. It's, it's an easy game. You have to know if there's more money than fools or more fools than money. And when there's more money than fools, asset prices go up. When there's more fools than money, asset prices go down. So um, the reality is, if I look at the cost of money today, I would say the cost of money still isn't very high. Um, and by the way, one of the signs that the cost of money isn't very high is that corporate spreads haven't really blown out. You know, for for banks blowing up, for you know all this talk about banking crisis, etc. What is amazing is how well behaved corporate bond markets have been, right? But the cost of money for for the corporate sector hasn't really blown out, uh, and the reason for that is the availability is actually still there. Um, and now I know bank lending is tightening, and all bank lending numbers are are, are collapsing. I know money supply growth is collapsing. I'm not blind. Uh, I can I can see all of this. Um, but I also know that when I look around the world today, I have in Japan, 
uh, a central bank that was supposed to end yield curve control, but that is still basically printing money willy-nilly. In China, where I spent you know, most of my time looking, our, we're headquartered in Hong Kong as a firm, um, you have a central bank that really for five years was tightening the, the tightening and uh, you know trying to prevent any new excesses from building up. And really in the past three, four months has decided to let it rip once again. Uh, and bank loans in China are re-accelerating and money supply growth is really accelerating, et cetera. Um, and then now all of a sudden in the US, you have a Fed balance sheet expansion. So in most of the world's major regions, um, central banks are back to, to, to adding uh, liquidity. So to, to your point, um, you know, will they cut interest rates? I don't think they will. I, I don't think they will cut interest rates, but I'm not sure it even matters that much because what matters more to me is the, is the availability of money more than the cost of money. I think uh, you're absolutely right from an investor standpoint. The availability of money, some would argue, is more important. I think for the consumer, the average layman who may not even be an investor, they care because they want their credit card interest rates down. They want their mortgage rates back down. And this is a question I get from my friends and family all the time. How long are, how long are mortgage rates going to stay elevated? I said, I don't know. Let me ask the experts. So let me ask you this question. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fine. Right. No, no, you're absolutely right. Um, I think that... Uh, you know, for the man in the street, the interest rate isn't coming down anytime soon. Um, and that puts a kibosh on consumption, on on the real estate market, as, as you point out. Um, it really curtails, and I would say, especially in the US, curtails people's ability to move and is therefore a huge dampener on productivity. You know, the, the big problem in the US today is, you know, you might, I don't know, be living in New York and you don't like your job and you can get a great job, let's say in Texas, um, the problem is you can't sell your house because if you sell your house here, uh, right now you, you're paying a mortgage of, I don't know, 3%, your, the mortgage on your house in Texas will be six. Um, so it's, uh, so, and that part I don't think changes anytime soon. Um, but you know, I, here's, here's an important point. Again, when you look at money, there's the cost of money and there's the availability of money. Uh, and I think if you look at the past 15 years, we lived in the U S in a period where the cost of money was too low for too long and the availability of money was also plentiful. And, um, and the US was kind of unique in that way. If you look at Europe, in Europe we had a very low cost of money but no availability of money. In, in basically most emerging markets, you had a high cost of money and, and not much availability. In the US, you had low cost and plenty of availability, which is why all the excesses in the past cycle took place in the US. Uh, all the crazy stuff, the FTX, the GameStop, the Bed Bath & Beyond, all the really stupid stuff took place in the US. Um, and I don't think that has been completely wrought out yet. Um, the cost of money in the US won't come down until, until you start to see big bankruptcies. And for me, FTX, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, they're not big enough yet to, to lead to the Fed shifting gears. So no, look, I think that unfortunately, for your friends asking you, when is my mortgage rate going to come down? I don't think anytime soon. Uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell has stated very clearly he needs to see the labor market soften before he even thinks about lowering rates. So probably not this year, he said, was the last press conference. Um, so you are in line with what he said. Now, the labor market is interesting in the U.S. because the last unemployment print was actually down, not up went down to 3.5%, not 3.6%. With all this talk of a recession, you'd expect the other way. So what's going on, Louis? Look, I think here, I think we need to be very modest. Uh, and, and I keep saying this in most of my interventions, but the reality is we're sitting in front of, in front of structural changes such as we've never seen. Um, and you, know, you, me, anybody who's under 75 years old has lived in a world with peace dividend, globalization, uh, the ability to outsource uh, more and more interest, more and more uh, spending abroad. Um, it's um, we've lived in a world where labor force kept on expanding, um, and you know just these two factors alone uh, have shifted dramatically in the past few years. Um, most countries, not least of which China, now have shrinking labor force. So the days where you had excess workers all the time, you could count on just putting in a help wanted sign and getting tons of resumes. That, that's over. Um, the days of, oh, I can outsource this to China who can do it cheaper, that's also over. Um, so 
Uh, yeah, I think we're look. We, we're now in a world where the you know I don't want to sound like a Marxist, but the skew has shifted from 25 years, capital lorded it over labor, and now all of a sudden labor is getting some pricing power back. Um, and you know you've you've seen the jo- the job openings numbers in the U.S. They're you know they're they've never been this high, um, even with an economy slowing. So yeah, I think for all these reasons, you know the the view of oh we'll raise interest rates, unemployment will go up, inflation will come down, um, it's not happening. In a world that's deglobalizing, in a world that's got too few workers, it's not going to happen. The CPI has been coming down steadily since its peak last year. Is this a temporary correction? You think? I think. Look, when you the problem. Okay, so first things first. Capitalism is a fundamentally deflationary force, right? Every businessman, every business owner shows up every day at work thinking, how can I do more with less? Uh, that, that's the beauty of capitalism. Tr- always trying to produce more with less. Less workers, less commodities, less everything. Um, so fundamentally, capitalism should be deflationary. And there's not so many inflationary examples. Um, where you find inflation is in closed economies like emerging markets that have capital controls, et cetera, or in periods like the 1970s. And what you find when you study inflationary periods is that once inflation comes out, it's an extremely volatile measure. Uh, you know, you'll be at 10%, and then the next year you'll be at four, and then the following year you'll be at 10. It's all over the place. Um, and usually spikes in inflation, as we had last year, the following year, if only because of base effects, come back down. Uh, but then you can reaccelerate very quickly. So yes, to your point, inflation has been rolling over been rolling over thanks to a pullback in energy prices. It's been rolling over thanks to a pullback in food prices, um, neither of which I think is likely to last. Um, you know, the, the pullback in energy was the result of a confluence of forces, the, the Chinese lockdown on the one hand, the release of strategic petroleum reserves on the other. Um, that's over. Uh, instead, we're now moving into a world where basically OPEC just told us we're drawing a, lo- a line at 70 bucks, like oil isn't going to go back below 70 bucks for a very long time. Um, they have, there is today a discipline within OPEC uh, that, you know, didn't used to happen, didn't used to exist in the past. There's not only, I would say, a discipline, there's also a genuine willingness to uh, break away from the U.S. Uh, political diktats. Uh, this, is a, this is a market shift. You know, it used to be that when push came to shove, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates and Kuwait and Oman and Bahrain could be trusted to do whatever the U.S. told them to do. Um, this is no longer the case. This is a, a very important shift uh, in in the world that we're living in. So, um, so yeah, you know, we've had right now we're benefiting and in the inflation numbers from the weaker oil, the weaker food. I don't think that lasts. Suppose you're right, and inflation ticks back up. Is it possible to also have a scenario where we have high inflation and also a weak labor market? In other words, high unemployment, productivity is slower, uh, perhaps perhaps demand is lower, but because of what you said earlier, because of all this excess liquidity that we've seen over the last 10 years, inflation is just unstoppable. Could that happen? And if so, what happens to policy? Um, so what happens then, I'll... There's a great, I don't want to, you know, toot, toot our French, like sound um, jingoistic or anything, but um, one of the greatest economists, I think, to sort of write about these periods and how the adjustments happened was, was a French economist called Jacques Rueff, um, who wrote a lot in the 60s and 70s um, about precisely the kind of environment you describe and, uh, and the adjustments that happened. And and Rueff's insights, which you know back then were were quite a big deal, is that uh, currencies end up being bearing the brunt of the adjustments of the macroeconomic variables. It's just it's just a path of least resistance for for policymakers to have the currencies uh, to bear the brunt of it. And again, if you're an emerging market investor, this this sounds so obvious because you, you see it all the time. All of a sudden, the emerging market currency just starts puking. Um, and, and this is what we're starting to witness today, except it's not an emerging market currency that's bearing the brunt of the adjustment. It's the U.S. dollar. Um, and it's a U.S. dollar that as the market realizes that the Fed actually doesn't have two mandates, but three mandates, and that one of these mandates is financial stability, and that the financial stability mandate will, will definitely 
lorded over and trump the um, uh, inflation or the employment mandate. Um, that the Fed will, uh, you know, print money if and when banks get in trouble, as we've just seen. Um, the U.S. dollar goes structurally down. Um, so again, it's you know, I look at my own job is not about what policymakers should do or even what they will do. Um, my job, you know, I always say my job is not to forecast; it's to adapt. Um, my job as a money manager, and what I am seeing today is a situation where the fiscal situation in the U.S. is, is ugly, um, where the financial situation in the U.S. is deteriorating. And the only thing the Fed can do about this is basically inject more money into the system. And that is exactly what they're doing. And the markets are behaving as you would expect given this, which is they're selling off the U.S. dollar. Um, and, and so that's the new environment we're in. Um, and if we're in an environment, so if we start off with the premise, we are now in an environment of weak US dollar, what does that mean for my portfolio? Um, and the first thing it means for my portfolio is that US treasuries are no longer the bedrock of, on which I can build my portfolio. Uh, it used to be that for 30 years, I own US treasuries, and if things go badly, um, then I know my US treasuries will do well for me because people will run to the dollar as a safe haven, and U.S. Treasuries will do well, et cetera. And this very sort of foundation of portfolios has completely failed in the past 18 months. You've done worse in U.S. Treasuries than you have in equities in pretty much any country. You've done worse in U.S. Treasuries than you have in emerging market bonds. You know, in the past 18 months, you're up, I don't know, 12, 15% on Brazilian government bonds. You're up, you know, 5% on Indonesian government bonds, and you're down... 10, 15% on US treasuries. Um, this has never happened in my career before. This is the shift that is unfolding in front of our eyes. And so as people conceptualize their portfolio and think, okay, where's my anti-fragile assets? You know, what in this new environment uh, can I count on to withhold value in my portfolio? I think there's only a few answers that 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 will that meet that. The, the first one is, is gold and more and more people are turning to that. The second is emerging market bonds. And the third is energy stocks. These are the things that will withstand their value in this new world we're entering. Energy stocks, emerging markets, and and gold. Let's talk about emerging markets first. You're, you're right. I mean, the yield on emerging market uh, fixed income uh, is, is has always been higher. But um, uh, as somebody who studied, uh, my, my finance professors might have told me, look, there's a reason for that. It's probably because the risk premium is, is priced in. There's a higher chance of default on a Brazilian bond. I'm not saying Brazil is going to default, but there is relatively a higher chance of, of something happening with Brazil than the U.S., which is traditionally viewed as risk-free. It's called the risk-free rate. Uh, so, um, do you th so but, but you're saying the risk-reward trade-off is still in favor of emerging markets. Is that what you're saying? You know, to uh, to your first point, Sir John Templeton said, Emer emerging markets are markets you can't emerge from in an emergency. Um, and so they never qualified as your typical anti-fragile asset because when things went bad, uh, emerging markets did badly, always. They were always the redhead stepchildren of, of markets. Um, you know, I, spend, I grew up and I spent most of, well, I grew up in France, but I, I spent most of my career in Asia. And in Asia, you know, Indonesia was the typical, I think as anything happened bad anywhere in the world, Indonesia got smacked. And for me, this in this cycle, what's fascinating is emerging last year in the midst of a global equity and bond market, bear market, um, emerging uh, Indonesian equities were up and Indonesian bonds were up, un unprecedented for me. So, so that tickles my attention because once again, I'm not paid to forecast, I'm paid to adapt. Um, and my vision of my, my read of the world today is that in this cycle, this past cycle, most of the excesses took place in the US. Um, now, if you agree with that, and you're starting to see the consequences of that, so like in Valley blowing up, FTX blowing up, et cetera, but, but you could see it just picking up your paper, all the stupid stuff, the GameStop, the Bed Bath & Beyond, all that stuff, it, it all happened in the US. So if you start off with that observation, and most of the capital misallocation, capital wastage, et cetera, in the past 10, 15 years was in the US because Cost of money was too low and availability of capital was too high. You start off with that, then you get to a very simple decision tree. And that is that as the cost of capital has now gone up and people need to start taking their loss on these bad investments, 
do you a think that the Fed is going to sit back and you know as the financial system implodes? Option one, in which case, then yes, you may want to be bullish U.S. Treasuries and bullish U.S. dollar. Or do you think b the Fed, as basically people hit the wall, the Fed will come in and try to smooth things over. Now, I would say that up until three, four weeks ago, you could still debate that question. Following Silicon Valley Bank, there is no more debate. We know what the Fed will do. They just did it. You had a problem, they re-inject 400 billion. Boom, from one day. For all their hawkish talk, for all their look at me, I'm going to take money out, etc. As soon as somebody hit the wall and somebody mildly influential, like who knew about Silicon Valley Bank um, before two months ago? Very few people. Um, but as soon as somebody hits the wall, the Fed is back in. So this is the world we live in. This is the world we now live in. And it's a world that is fundamentally bearish US dollar. Um, so that's got to be your starting point. And from there, it's a world that's bearish US dollar is a world that should be bullish emerging markets. Um, I, I know that uh, emerging market debt, a lot of it is the sovereign debt is denominated in US dollars. So your thesis that the US dollar declines may also be uh, good for their, for their uh, at, at least from their interest expense payoff uh, side as well. So let's talk about which emerging markets you prefer and which has the best, you think, growth prospects, risk adjusted growth prospects, because the emerging markets is very, you know, very broad. A lot of emerging markets we can discuss. That's a, that's a great point. And, and to be honest, I, uh, I hate the term emerging market. And I use it, I started using it and I use it. You know, emerging market was, uh, was basically a term invented by fund marketers in the 1970s to, uh, to push a bunch of countries together that had very little to do with, with each other, right? Um, the one I've thing always had, thought it was basically anything that isn't, you know, yeah, how, do, how do we market North America, Europe, everything that's not North America and Europe? That's right. Uh, well, and, and, you know, the way they put it together is by looking at, they say, oh, all these countries have positive demographic profiles, you know, very few old people, lots of young people. So that's how they put all these countries together. But they don't even have that to, in common anymore, right? You look at China and India, completely different demographic profiles. India still has lots of young people. China is now starting to age fast. Uh, Korea and Taiwan already aging very fast. Uh, even Thailand, just look at two neighbors, Thailand and Malaysia, already very different demographic. So, so emerging markets, to your point, yeah, it can mean anything and everything and many different things to everyone. The one thing I would highlight, though, and that, that I find quite interesting, is that in the old days, up until about 10 years ago, even though they were so different and had very different economic drivers, Emerging markets used to behave as one. So basically, you know, you'd buy an emerging market fund, and because there was, let's say, a problem in Brazil, or actually, let's take Ukraine and Russia, right? In uh, in the old days, up until 10, 15 years ago, something like Russia and Ukraine happening would have absolutely crushed all of emerging markets because the only marginal buyer of emerging market assets was typically a foreigner. And something bad happens in Russia. So he says, oh, I'm going to redeem my emerging market fund. And so all of a sudden, the fund has to sell Brazil and he has to sell China and has to sell India, even though that has nothing to do with what's happening in Russia. Everything goes down because there's no buyer on the other side. This is, of course, the big change is that now you have domestic savers in every one of these markets. So something bad can happen in Russia and Ukraine. Something horrible can happen in Russia and Ukraine. And it doesn't mean that Brazil sells off. It doesn't mean that Indonesia sells off. Because the marginal buyer in those markets is now local instead of a foreigner. Now, having said all this, I think if you want to sort of make look, think of the emerging markets in a little bit of a simpler way, you can break them down somewhat. Uh, first, you have the emerging markets uh, that depend on the commodity cycle, that are net commodity exporters. So that's most of Latin America, that's most of Africa, that's obviously the whole Middle East. Used to be Russia, but of course you don't invest in Russia anymore. So, you know, and then you have your commodity importing uh, emerging markets. That's uh, a lot of the countries in Asia, most notably China, of course, um, and, uh, and India. Um, so you've got that split. Um, you also have a, you know, other splits. You, you have a couple guys, mostly Taiwan and Korea, that are highly dependent on the tech cycle. Um, so that's, that's another sort of uh, breakdown. But let, let's keep it simple and say commodity producing versus commodity, um, commodity consuming. Um, and here, this is where it gets tricky. Uh, this is where today's outlook is especially challenging. 
because for the first time in my career, you have the number one economy in the world, namely the US, slowing and slowing. You know, look at leading indicators, ISM surveys, et cetera. Looks like the US is slowing, you know, meaningfully. Um, and at the same time, you have the second largest economy, who's now almost as big as the US, reaccelerating and where policymakers are really stepping on the gas to, to get things to get things going again. And so from there, it's like, okay, what does that mean for commodity demand? What does that mean for global growth? Like one guy's going one way and the other guy's going the opposite way. Um, now, you know, we're all the fruits of our own experiences. I've spent most of my career looking at China. When I see the Chinese government um, stimulating, when I see the Chinese economy reaccelerating, when I see construction loans picking up very rapidly as they are doing right now, um, for me, that tends to spread to other emerging markets. It tends to mean higher commodity prices and it tends to spread to uh, into the Middle East. It tends to spread into Indonesia, Malaysia, et cetera. So I'm a, I'm a believer that Chinese growth is going to surprise on the upside in the next nine to 12 months and that this will have big impacts positively everywhere. Now, then the question becomes, how do you play it? Um, you know, do you buy Latin America? Do you buy China directly? Um, it's after that, it becomes a relative value game. Um, and it also becomes a game on your own tolerance for risk. If you're, if you've got a low tolerance for risk, buy Asian Fink income or Latin American Fink income. You know, today you can build yourself. I think there's five credible central banks in Latin America, you know, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, Chile, and Brazil. You build yourself a blended portfolio of, of these four, uh, these five uh, bond markets. You end up with very undervalued currencies. You buy local debt, very undervalued currencies, and you know real yields of probably around three or four percent. Um, now, why wouldn't you do this? And currencies again that are undervalued on a purchasing parity basis by one or two standard deviation against the U.S. dollar. Like, why on earth would you want to own a U.S. Treasury when you can own that instead? Um, and and by the way, it is outperforming. It's it's beating the pants out of U.S. Treasuries for the past eighteen months, even against a challenging macro backdrop. And now the macro backdrop is getting good again. So if you're like low risk tolerance, I would say buy Latin American government debt. If you've got high risk tolerance, I would say go out and buy Chinese equities, uh, buy Chinese corporate debt that has been absolutely slaughtered. Um, it's uh, it, it, it all depends where you want to position yourself on the risk return spectrum. Uh, okay, I want to talk a little bit about energy. So thank you for that recap on the uh, emerging markets. Uh, I want to talk about energy because you said you're bullish on energy stocks. Typically, in the past, historically, energy stocks have been correlated with high growth economically for for uh, global growth. That is, are you is that your assumption that that global growth is going to pick up? Is that why you're bullish on energy, or is there another reason? I'm going to make like a Jesuit priest and answer your question with another question, which is, you know, what was what was the the best what was the best performing stock um, sector last year in the U.S. It was energy, right? Uh, in 2022, the only way you made money in the market was if, uh, if you were long energy and, um, you know, and last year already leading indicators were rolling over and ISM surveys were rolling over. Um, so uh, here's my take on energy. I own energy, not so much uh, because I think global growth is gonna reaccelerate, et cetera. Although it is definitely a play on, on China reaccelerating, no doubt. Um, but I actually own energy for another reason. Um, and that is that in an inflationary environment, bonds no longer act as equity diversification for you. They, they just don't. And we saw this in 2022. Um, the, what acts as portfolio diversification is energy because in an in inflation environment, the risk isn't so much on interest rates. Uh, the, in an inflationary environment, the risk is that oil goes to 100 or 150 bucks that will crush equity markets that will suck liquidity out of out of the global economy and that will force central banks hands so when you look at our landscape today of global markets the real risk for me isn't that the fed hikes another 25 or 50 basis points frankly i don't give a hoot if they want to raise another 25 or 50 uh, or if they cut 25 or 50 it, it really doesn't change anything it doesn't change I think much on the global outlook. It doesn't change much on the earnings power of most of the companies I own. But if oil goes to 100 or, or 150 bucks, that's where everything falls apart. 
Um, and this is what happened in 2008. Oil went to 150 bucks and the global economy fell apart. So for me, the risk today is oil going to 100 or 150. Um, and if that happens, I'm going to be taking kick, kickings everywhere. Um, you know, I own a lot of Asian bonds. Um, we, as a house, we're very focused on Asian bonds. Um, so, you know, I, I'll get crushed there. Um, so for me, energy is the owning energy stocks is the, is the, is a much better hedge than owning U.S. Treasuries. Um, and so in terms of portfolio construction, I don't see why, you know, everybody should have at least 10 or 15% in energy stocks. Uh, because again, that's the risk. That's the risk in the, in the, in the market. And, you know, if energy prices is sidelined, well, I'm owning companies that are generating great positive cash flows and that are buying back their stock and giving special dividends and returning capital to shareholders. So, you know, if nothing happens on energy, I'm very happy owning them. And if oil prices own go to 150 bucks, then I'll think, darn, I don't own enough. Um, meanwhile, of course, energy is like 4% of the S&P 500. Um, so anybody who's just, oh, it's okay, I own the S&P 500, so I own a well-diversified portfolio. Yep, you own a well-diversified portfolio until oil goes to 150 bucks. And if oil goes to 150 bucks, then your portfolio is not diversified at all. You own the S&P 500, everything is correlated and everything is falling. I, I know this is a long-term tailwind or headwind rather, and probably has no immediate impact on your allocation, but are you not concerned about the rise of electric vehicles and basically the obsolescence of oil in the automotive sector? Um, again, I'm not paid to forecast, I'm paid to adapt. Sure. Um, so once that happens, you'll adapt. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. But, you know, look, for the past 10 years, we've been talking about how, and, you know, all, all the cars are going electric, et cetera. Uh, the reality is it is happening in the more developed markets, it's definitely happening in China, you know, where I spend a lot of time. You're seeing more and more electric cars. The government has been pushing it extremely, extremely hard. Um, but the reality is when you look at global oil demand, um, you know, and, you know, right now we're at roughly 100 million barrels per day. And this time next year, we'll probably add about 103 million barrels per day. You know, the, the structural demand for oil, uh, partly because it's not just electric, it's not just vehicles. You know, it's, of course, airplanes, it's, uh, it's military. I mean, look, something like just the Ukraine war adds 500,000 barrels per day of oil demand. You know, like moving all these tanks around and these warships and these planes, that burns a ton of oil. Um, and if we want to remilitarize, because, you know, supposedly China is about to invade Taiwan, which I don't believe for a second, but if we want to all of a sudden have, you know, three aircraft carriers, and, and when I say we, I mean the Western world, uh, but it's really the U.S. If the U.S. wants to have three aircraft carriers floating around the Pacific, um, you know what? They don't run on solar panels. Um, they, uh, they're they going to make up for a lot of the electric cars. Uh, just that, just have, you know. The, the seventh Pacific fleet move around a little more aggressively. So um, uh, the, the bottom line is you look at, take a, a chart of global oil demand. Of course, we had a massive dip because of COVID, but smooth that out. And for all the talk about electric cars, the demand curve is very stable. It just keeps going up like this because of population growth, because of the marginal demand for, uh, for energy comes from emerging markets where, you know, the power grids can't cope with electric cars. So, you know, as people get richer in Vietnam and in Indonesia and in India, they buy motorbikes, they buy electric cars. They buy, sorry, they don't buy electric cars. They buy uh, ICE uh, cars, uh, internal combustion engine cars. Um, so, no, I'm uh, not too worried about the electric car. Okay. Uh, finally, I want to talk about your your fund. Uh, give us give us your breakdown on on uh, some key stats here. So your AUM, your overall strategy. You've already mentioned some of your top picks and uh, um, and how you're allocated. But yeah, just give us give us a sense of the size and um, how you're positioned today. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, first, so we do different things. Um, where uh, we have several several funds. Uh, so we started off. Uh, back in 2005, uh, we launched the first uh, Asian equity usage product. Uh, and we started off with, with Asian equities. Um, then we launched a global equity fund, which, uh, which I run today. Um, and when China uh, opened up um, its, um, uh, its um, a bond market to foreign investors, we thought, all right, this is a really big deal. 
And, you know, for the we have the chance to be in the same starting blocks as Fidelity or Schroeder's or HSBC or any one of the giants of or BlackRock or any one of the giants of the money management industry. Um, and so we were the, the first ones to launch a, a usage fund on, uh, on Chinese fixed income. Uh, and we grew quite a big China fixed income business. We, uh, we managed to grow it to about $3 billion in, in assets under management. Um, so that made us, I think, uh, by far the, the biggest of the, small, of the independents. I think the only people that manage, the only, sorry, Westerners, Western firms that manage more money in Chinese fixed income were uh, BlackRock, Schroeder's, and PIMCO. Um, so it was, you know, it, again, it was a tremendous opportunity to be in a starting block. At, uh, at the, we were in the right place at the right time. Um, so we've, you know, sort of gone down the wormhole of me- me- building an a- Asian uh, fixed income franchise. Um, today, uh, in the U.S., we manage an, an Asian government bond ETF, uh, AGOV, uh, stands for Asian Government Bond, um, and which, you know, I think is a, is a good product if you're looking to diversify away from the U.S. dollar. Um, and it's a it's a local currency government bond fund. So we own, you know, China, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, India, um, etc. Uh, government bonds. Um, so that's 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 what we do on the sort of institutional money management side of our business. Uh, then we also, you know, as as we grew an institutional money management business, it it became pretty obvious to us that uh, uh, actually private wealth was a much better business. Um, and so we we bought a stake uh, in a firm called Evergreen in uh, in uh, based in Bellevue, just outside of Seattle. Uh, and I think you've had David Hay on your show before, who's the, the CIO of the of, of our Evergreen business. So that's called Evergreen Gafcal, and that manages about um, four, four billion in, in assets under management. And then finally, we recently bought a, a private wealth business in Mauritius um, for people uh, looking for offshore solutions. Um, Mauritius is one of these the the few remaining neutral uh, offshore financial. Uh, uh, centers, you know, a bit like Singapore and Hong Kong, but uh, Mauritius has historically been an offshore center for India and for Africa. Um, and uh, so we're, we're going to be doing more stuff uh, in, the, in those regions as well. So that's roughly who we are. I'd love to talk to you uh, uh, more next time. We're out of time today, but I'd love to talk to you more next time about emerging markets and the difference between emerging and frontier markets. You mentioned Mauritius, so I, I love to get your take as to whether or not there is a difference, or maybe that's just another marketing package. <laughs> the um, well, to be honest, it's been uh, the the liquidity in frontier markets um, has completely disappeared. When when I started in this business, you had five or six big African funds. I think you have none left. There's there's no more African funds, and that has hurt something like the merchant stock market, where you know. As these funds have redeemed, it's there's no more liquidity. Um, so I think the you know if emerging markets are markets you can't emerge emerge from in an emergency, uh, frontier markets are markets you can't even get in uh, these days because there's there's just absolutely no liquidity whatsoever. Uh, Louis, I really appreciate your time today. Excellent insights and uh, um, best of luck with your investing. I'll speak with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Great to see you. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. If you'd like to check out my interview with David Hay, co-CIO of Evergreen Gafcal, check out the link in the description down below.